anyway, I should tell you that this is uh, joint work with uh, my PhD student, Rachel Barber in the US and a lot of y'all know her. Uh, she should hopefully be uh, graduating uh, this uh, semester. And this is sort of uh, the reason I was looking at this uh, material again. You may have heard her uh, talk about this material before. I think she's given, she's certainly given talks about it. Um, but uh, I'm gonna take a little bit of a different point of view. Uh, than she did. So even if you've seen her talk, uh, this should be a little different. So the first part of the talk, I'm just going to try to give you all of the definitions that you need uh, to first understand the problem. Then once we have that, we'll talk about the problem a little bit. Um, then we'll get the definitions that we need to see the solution uh, to what the original problem was. And then for me, uh, the focus of the talk is going to be on the stuff that follows uh, the main theorem, in that there are some consequences that maybe some people uh, know, but in my, as far as I know, these are not widely understood. Uh, and I think uh, they're, they're sort of important. Uh, to me, there's something at the end that basically everybody who works in algebraic graph theory should have some idea about, even if it isn't the, the forefront, one at the back of your mind. All right. Um, sorry, I'm trying to... There we go. Okay. Um, so uh, we're going to be talking about Cayley graphs. So I'll go ahead and give you the uh, definitions just to make sure everybody's happy. So we're going to let G be a group. Uh, S is going to be a proper subset of G such that S is S inverse and the identity is not an S. These conditions here uh, just ensure that you have a, uh, a graph uh, and uh, without loops. So we'll define a Cayley graph of G. I'll call it uh, Cayley GS, which I guess is normal. Um, I want it to be the diagram for the vertex set G and edge set uh, given uh, as follows. We'll have uh, an edge from G to GS. G lives in G and S is in S. And S is gonna be called the connection set. And I will actually will use that term. So here I have a little example uh, for you. This is the Cayley graph on Z10 with connection set one, three, uh, seven, nine. And this just means that if you look at the neighbors of one, they're gonna be one plus one is two, one plus three is four, one uh, plus seven is eight, and one plus nine is zero. And you can play that game uh, at every single vertex and that will uh, give you uh, the entire graph. Um, the title had diagraphs in it for the talk. Uh, I'm only going to discuss graphs um, but all of the results and all the comments and things like that, uh, these hold for digraphs as well and for double coset digraphs. Um, all you have to do are what the quote obvious modifications are. Okay. Um, first thing I need to tell you about is uh, the wreath product. So let's let uh, gamma one and gamma two be graphs. The wreath product of gamma one and gamma two, I'm gonna denote it with this symbol here sort of a backwards integral sign. If you're into LaTeX, um, it's actually backslash WR. So LaTeX recognizes this as the read product symbol. A lot of people use uh, square brackets. So a square bracket here, a square bracket there to make you think perhaps of uh, function composition. And there's a reason for that. This is a graph of the vertex set. Uh, the vertex is just gonna be uh, the Cartesian product of the vertex sets of the graphs. And the edge set, it looks pretty complicated. There's two parts. Um, so the first part is UV, UV prime. Um, here, U is just gonna be a vertex, uh, a fixed vertex, and um, the edge VV prime has to be in gamma two. The other kind of edge is gonna look like UV, U prime, V prime. Uh, U, U prime is an edge. So there's an edge in the first graph, and then V and V prime are arbitrary edges, uh, vertices in uh, gamma two. Um, how should I say, if you stop me on the street, I'll be able to write this definition down, um, but uh, most people don't really remember uh, the definition because uh, intuitively it's easy to think of how to construct uh, the wreath product. Um, sorry. So first what we'll do is we're gonna have uh, for each vertex of gamma one, uh, we're gonna have a copy of the graph gamma two. 
sorry about how this is working out. It's not doing so well. So probably what I'll do is uh, when I get to a new slide, I'll just get the full page and we will have to do this. Okay, so we get a copy of gamma one for uh, gamma two for each vertex of gamma one. And we index these by the elements of the vertex set of gamma one. And between these corresponding copies of gamma two, we place every possible edge from one copy to another, or we don't have any, if there is no edge. Okay, so for each, if you have copies of gamma two that correspond to an edge in gamma one, we put a complete bipartite graph between those two copies, or we don't put anything at all. So I've got some examples. Um, actually, a PhD student of mine uh, came up with these. Uh, so we'll look at gamma one that's just an edge, and gamma two is this sort of random graph here. So I put a copy of gamma one and a copy of gamma two. This one, of course, is indexed by zero, and this copy is indexed uh, by one. So zero is connected to one in gamma one. So what I will do is put every possible edge from this copy to that copy. And let me just click through to the end, and you can see there's a complete bipartite graph from here over to here. Uh, wreath products were first studied, uh, introduced by Harari. Um, he had a particular purpose in mind, which I'll, I'll tell you in, in a little bit, um, but these graphs are actually quite useful and they've popped up in a variety of contexts and so they have a variety of names. So let me get all the names that I know. Um, so it's also called the lexicographic product. This term is actually quite popular. Uh, especially amongst uh, people uh, in the Australian group. They like to call it the lexicographic product. One of the first people to study uh, wreath products or le lexicographic products was uh, Sabadusi, and he's the one that introduced this term lexicographic product. At the time, uh, he did this for a very specific reason, in that this was the first graph product that was known where the order mattered. And of course, lexicographic means that you have to go in order. Before then, uh, you know, gamma one product, gamma two was always the same as gamma two product, gamma one. And that's why he called them the lexicographic product. And in my view, uh, we're pretty used to uh, having products that uh, don't commute. So I'm not so happy with that one. Harari called it graph composition. Uh, and he just sort of thought of you're putting a copy of gamma two into uh, gamma one. In this gamma two extension of gamma one, um, some people in a different area uh, started calling it that um, uh, just a few years ago. So this was rediscovered uh, many times. Uh, let me give you another example. And this is also why, I, one of the reasons I like to call it the read product is let's consider um, the cycle uh, C8, which I'll just label like that, and a copy of a K2, and I'll use A and B. And this is K2 bar. So let me go ahead and get the whole graph out. So there it is. You'll see it looks like a nice wreath. What you want to do is put down eight copies of K2 bar. There's the first one indexed with zero. There's a second one indexed with one. Notice that it, since it's a K2 bar, you don't actually have to do anything there. There's the, the two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then we're back to zero. A lot of people like to call this a wreath graph. Uh, and it is a, a wreath product or a lexicographic product as well. And since it's the Christmas season, uh, maybe that's not so bad. Okay, now, the reason I like to call it the wreath product is uh, there's a corresponding group theoretic wreath product um, as well. And Harari invented the wreath product of graphs because he wanted a product uh, whose automorphism group was the group theoretic wreath product of the automorphism groups of the two graphs in mind. Now, we know what the automorphism group of uh, a cycle of length eight is. It's a dihedral group of order 16. 
you know the automorphism group of K2 bar. And if you think about this, uh, that there is, you can see these automorphism groups in this graph. For example, uh, you can certainly rotate uh, this wreath in an eight step rotation, just like you would in a dihedral group of order 16. You can also see that the reflections of the dihedral group are also there. The, K, the S2 for the K2, uh, if you just pick one of these, you'll notice that you can just sort of uh, swap it at will. And you can swap any of these in any, uh, any number of them uh, that you like. And then of course you can combine that. And it turns out that that's exactly what the permutational wreath product is. Group theorists like to define it as a, a semi-direct product. If you don't know what that term means, uh, you're perfectly fine because I'm not going to define it that way. If you look at the group that I just outlined, we sort of have these copies of gamma two as blocks. And I'm going to think of them, if you know what that term means, uh, that's actually what they are. But I'm going to think of these as just sort of being grouped together. I'll call the groups blocks. And the D8 permutes the blocks. And then within a block, I get to do uh, whatever I like in accordance with the automorphism group of the second graph, the K2 bar. Um, so think of these sets. I guess they're not J's. It should maybe be an A. I can't remember. But you take any automorphism of the cycle of length, think of it as permuting those blocks. A block is mapped to another block by any automorphism of K2 bar. And uh, you can choose these independently. If you choose them all the same, you would just have the regular Cartesian product. And this is the group ought, uh, C8 wreath ought K2 bar. And that's what Harari uh, was after. So let me give you the formal definition. This is, uh, for group theorists, this would be a very strange definition. But if you go back in the day, um, the first time I saw this definition, it was actually in a, a, a paper by Savadusi from the mid 50s. So this used to be a common definition of the wreath product, not so popular anymore, um, but it's the easiest one to uh, understand. So I'm gonna take a permutation group. It's gonna be acting on a set X or permuting a set a, X and H um, permuting Y. We'll define the wreath product of G and H. I'll denote it with the same symbol that I used before uh, to be, I forgot, there, uh, there is a set of all permutations of S cross Y. And what you do is in the first coordinate, you permute with an element of G. And in the second coordinate, you permute with an element of H. And that H depends upon uh, you know, which uh, coordinate of, the, of X you're in. So that's this group uh, G wreath H. Now, you may think that, uh, you don't quite understand that yet. Uh, and if you've never seen it before, you're not really gonna pick it up fully uh, the, with a simple glance at the definition. Anyway, Ooh, maybe I wrote something else. Oh, and uh, what he says is easy to see that if you have graphs gamma and delta, then the wreath product of the automorphism groups is contained in the automorphism group of the wreath product. That's what Harari was after with equality here. And uh, that problem has been sorted out. It was sorted out by Sabadusi pretty quick. Okay. So with all that in mind, um, I can tell you about the problem. Um, what I wanted uh, to do is to be able to find necessary and sufficient con conditions on the connection set of a kalygraph of G uh, so that the kalygraph is isomorphic to a wreath product, and I want both graphs to have at least two vertices. If you pick either gamma one or gamma two to have one vertex, uh, then you're really not doing anything at all with the wreath product, just sort of changing the vertex set a little bit. So I wanted necessary and sufficient conditions to recognize a wreath product of a Cayley graph um, solely based on the connection set. And um, as I've gotten older, I've become a little, I wouldn't say, more ambitious, but I've learned to be a little more thorough. Uh, I want uh, I want extra information. I don't want to just know that it's a wreath product. I want to know what the graphs are as well. All right, is anything known? Uh, the answer turns out to be uh, yes. Uh, 
If you have a Kelly graph of an abelian group, it turns out to be isomorphic to a wreath product of two smaller. Okay, I got a little typo. I should have graph there. If and only if you can find a proper non trivial subgroup B of A. And if you take out the elements of B from the connection set, what you're left with is a union of cosets of B. Now notice I didn't say left or right because of course in an abelian group, left and right cosets are the same. So this was shown uh, explicitly for prime powers uh, by uh, Joy Morris uh, and then Isfahn and Mary Servatius. Um, oops, sorry, something strange happened for me. Um, so Joy Morris sorted out the odd prime power case and then Istvan and Mary Servatius sorted out the power of two. And you may think that, wow, um, Joy doing all the odd primes uh, and then the prime two uh, being done separately that the odd one was bigger. Uh, and in some sense, this is not true. Uh, some people will say that two is the oddest prime of all. And this is one of the cases uh, where that's true. To me, the power of two part is much more difficult. Uh, than the uh, odd prime powers. So this was not a trivial uh, extension of that. And uh, with one of my uh, PhD students, Shomo Bumik, who graduated a few years ago, and Joy Morris, we mentioned that this works for all abelian groups, uh, but we didn't uh, prove it. Okay, so I decided uh, to give this problem to my PhD students. So, uh, I thought maybe it would be kind or a good idea if I had some idea of what the answer was before I just sort of threw her to the dogs or I mean gave her the problem. Um, so it's actually pretty easy if you want to see does this idea work, i.e. it's just a union of left cosets or even right cosets of a subgroup of G, uh, this doesn't turn out to work. It was very, very hard to come up with such an example so hard that my first guess of group and first guess of left and right coset was successful. So this is actually really easy uh, to do. It's not hard uh, at all. Um, now, if you know about double cosets, double coset graphs, we'll talk about those in just a minute. Uh, next obvious thing is not thinking of left or right, but maybe thinking of left and right cosets of a subgroup. And this is what turned out to work. So let me tell you, uh, well, first, let me get everything out here. Okay. So let me tell you what a double coset of H and G is. Uh, there's a more general definition. Um, I'll talk about that in just a second, but we're not going to care. Uh, so I'll take a group, I take a subgroup, and then I take an element of the group. I'm gonna look at the set HSH, and this looks just like what you would think it would. I'm gonna multiply on the left by an ele element of H1, and then I'll have S in the middle, and I'll have H2 on the right. And H1 and H2 get to vary uh, for all H. So if you choose H1 to be the identity, uh, this is just gonna give you the right coset uh, of H, oh, left coset, sorry, uh, SH. And if you choose H2 to be uh, one, you'll get the right coset, HS. So HSH is a, a union of both left and right uh, cosets. Now, if I take, say, a connection set, S, um, I'll pretty much do the same thing, but I want to let the S vary as well. Um, so if I do it with the big S, it's going to be a union of double cosets of H and G. It's not too hard to show that the set of double cosets are uh, a partition. Um, so I will just leave it there. Now I'm sort of gonna define a double coset graph. I'm gonna let G be a group just like above, H a subgroup just like above, and I'll, I'll take a connection set. I want to uh, define a graph cosine G H S. The vertex set is gonna be the set of left cosets and the edge set is gonna look like uh, this, yikes. If you've never seen uh, double coset graphs before, they're sort of, uh, uh, how shall I say, a little bit difficult to get your mind around. One of the reasons I wanted to talk to you about this is that there's sort of a, an easier, at least to me, 
from a graph theoretic point of view, easier way of thinking about these, uh, which we will see uh, in this class, uh, in this class ah, lecture. I have a class this shortly after the lecture, so it's sort of on my mind. Now, a lot of people will just say that uh, what we have to have true is that S has to be equal to HSH instead of A is in here. I sort of like this formulation because I get to pick my S, but a lot of people will just say, no, you don't get to pick your S. Um, I'm gonna pick G, I'm gonna pick H, and then you have a restricted number of choices for S. They have to satisfy S equals HSH. Okay. Now, there's some things missing from this definition. Uh, this is actually the definition of a coset digraph. Uh, and so you'd need some extra conditions to make sure that it's a graph. You'd need also make sure that it's not loops, but quite frankly, we don't care. So uh, I didn't feel the need to put it in. Okay. Oh, apparently there's something else at the bottom. Oh, yes. If you choose your connections, uh, your subgroup H to just be the identity, a coset graph is just a Cayley graph of G. So there, uh, there's more stuff there than just uh, uh, the Cayley graphs. But so it's a wider class of graphs. Now, if you go to another talk, um, there's a convention that people have about double coset graphs. And that is they like to insist that H is core free in G, or H contains no normal non-trivial subgroup of G. The reason they like to do this is that if you are gonna sit down and construct one of these graphs, um, you, you might want the action, the left multiplication action of G on the left cosets of GH. Remember that's the vertex set of the double coset graph. You might want that to be faithful, i.e. Uh, there's no element of G which fixes each of the left cosets. This convention is actually quite useful if you're actually constructing a double coset graph, and we will not be doing that. And so I will not follow this convention. And it actually turns out that for our purposes, this makes life uh, harder. And actually some of, uh, some of the things I'll tell you later aren't going to be true even. So, the convention is good in some situations, uh, it's not in others. I'm going to sort of break convention in another way as well. Um, I like to choose my connection set, be anything I like. Uh, you, that was sort of built into the definition before. And so here, it will be useful to actually think of these uh, a little bit differently. Typically, what people will do is you'll pick your group G, you'll pick your subgroup H, and then S has to be a union of double cosets, so it has to look like this. So you fix your G, you fix your H, and then you don't get to pick S to be whatever you want. You, it has to satisfy certain conditions. Here, it's going to be better to think of choosing G, as you would, than choosing S to be whatever you want, and then your choice of S will determine the possible choices uh, for H. So I like to think of my double coset graphs, uh, at least for this talk, let me get the definition here. I'm gonna choose my G first, I'll choose my H, my S, and then that will determine the H. So the notation is even set up to make you think, okay, choose G, then choose H, uh, then S. I'm gonna think of, think of going uh, the other way. Okay. Um, in order to state the theorem, I need to tell you a little bit about quotients. Um, so uh, here we are. This is the, the usual quotient uh, that people in graph theory do. We'll let gamma be a graph, and I'll just let P be a partition of the vertex set. I will define the quotient graph of gamma with respect to this partition. I'll denote it in sort of a, a quotient-like way, gamma mod script P, to be the graph with vertex set uh, script P and edge set well, P and two cells in the partition will be adjacent if some vertex of one is adjacent to some uh, vertex of the other. So I don't have to have every edge between the cells. I just have to have one. So let me give you an example. Uh, and the way to, if you want to describe this succinctly, when we quotient, we're going to map edges to edges 
Uh, and non edges, they get mapped to either non edges or edges. So here, this is that first graph we had, and this is just a hokey example. So the cells of the partition uh, are done by color. I hope you can see them. Zero and one is red, two and three is orange, four is purple, five is green, six and seven are blue, and eight and nine are yellow. Um, and if you look at zero and one, well, uh, zero is adjacent to two. That tells me that this zero is adjacent to uh, that one, which I called uh, one, because it's just counting the number of vertices. So the labels here are, are pretty irrelevant. And I don't care that, well, one is adjacent to two. That, I guess that's sort of a bonus, uh, but I don't really care. As soon as I see that zero is adjacent to two, I know the red vertex is adjacent to the orange vertex. Um, yeah, and you just repeat that for every vertex. So this green one, um, five is adjacent to four here. That means the green one is adjacent to the purple one, um, but no green vertex, there's just one, is adjacent to eight or nine, and so there's no edge there. Okay, and this is the usual quotient that people will define. Um, People like this quotient because it's always defined. There's a stronger quotient that isn't always defined where edges get mapped to edges and non-edges get mapped to non-edges. Um, this quotient, the one we just looked at where edges are mapped to edges but non-edges are not, um, doesn't preserve all the graph theoretic information uh, of the quotient. So if you look at this graph, you can see how carefully I drew it. Uh, the key thing here is that between any of these blobs, these the blobs are going to represent the cells of the partition. Uh, I've got an edge and I've got a non-edge. Uh, and so that means that with this graph, its quotient is going to be a complete graph on three vertices. And if you go to the complement, because some vertex in each blob is not adjacent to some vertex in each blob, the quotient of the complement will also be K3. Now, some information is preserved, but if you're just looking at a K3, uh, there's no way uh, that you're going to be able to reconstruct this graph without extra information. And I guess that's where covers come in. But, oh, great. We're to the point now where I can actually tell you the theorem. The theorem is obviously very long. Um, that's because I wanted to sort of uh, do everything. You don't need to pay attention to everything. The first part says that uh, a Cayley graph of a group G is isomorphic to a wreath product of two vertex transitive graphs of smaller order. That was my problem that I wanted to solve. And then there's an if and only if, okay. Uh, and it's a similar type thing. To the abelian case, you find a proper subgroup K of G that's non-trivial, you look at the connection set, take out the elements of K, and before we had a union of cosets of K, now we have a union of double cosets of K. So it's pretty much the same condition as before. Insert the word double. Now, the rest of this stuff, uh, you can probably not pay much attention to it if you like. Um, I also said I wanted to know the graphs, and there they are. Um, it's coset, it's a wreath product, gamma the quotient by script B. Script B here is just the left cosets of K and G. So I tell you the partition. This is the subgraph of gamma induced by K. And this is isomorphic in terms of coset and K graphs, is coset GKS wreath. Uh, Kaylee K, S intersect K. Uh, I'm sure you're going to forget the details, but just remember that, okay, I know what the graphs are. Finally, as a bonus, uh, we went ahead and calculated the full automorphism group. And this is a little bit important for what comes later. Um, so if it's not sort of a stupid case, our stupid case here is that gamma is complete or the complement of a complete graph. If you choose K to be maximal in G, such that it's a union of double 
such that this condition is true, uh, then the automorphism group is just weak product. So if I pick my subgroup K correctly, the automorphism group of this Cayley graph is uh, isomorphic to the automorphism group of two smaller uh, graphs. Okay, so there's the theorem. The big part we were after was a union of double cosets of K. Um, now I'd like to talk to you about a paper of Sabaduces. Um, in the course of thinking about once we had the recognition theorem, what we could do with it, uh, Rachel and I actually discovered something that Sabaduce uh, knew uh, a long time ago, actually in 1964. So, in, a paper in uh, 1964, the paper is called Vertex Transitive Graphs. Um, in theorem two of his paper, he proves a, a, a very well-known uh, result. And he proved that every vertex transitive graph is isomorphic to a double coset, I should have graph there, of G, where G is a transitive subgroup of the automorphism group of gamma. Now, nowadays, everybody uses the definition of a coset digraph that I gave you, a coset graph that I gave you. Sabaduce didn't. So let me tell you a little bit more about what he did. So his definition of a double coset graph, what he did was he constructed a Cayley graph for G, and he found a subgroup H of G such that the Cayley graph mod the left cosets of H in G as a quotient was isomorphic to the original graph. So Sabaduce was thinking uh, certainly in quotients here. And so we've got the Cayley graph, we mod it uh, by with the partition of the left cosets of G, we get something that's isomorphic to gamma. Now in theorem four of the same paper, he showed something else. He showed that a multiple uh, of gamma is isomorphic to a Cayley graph of G. So in other words, if you're thinking of Cayley graphs and coset graphs, what happens is a coset graph is a quotient of a Cayley graph, but then you can recover a Cayley graph uh, somehow using this multiple. And this is uh, the way, this is Sabaduce's terminology, and this is what everybody uses. So if you look in, say, the handbook of graph products, I think it's mentioned there. Uh, lots of people know this. Um, so this multiple is isomorphic to a Cayley graph of G. And again, G is just a transitive a subgroup of the automorphism group. And the stabilizer of a point here, uh, I'm gonna call H. Now it turns out that this multiple that he constructs is actually a wreath product with an empty graph. Um, so this is sort of the definition of what a multiple is. Uh, so if you looked at, uh, he. The notation he used was little n for telling you the size of the multiple and gamma. And he it was just the original graph, wreath, an empty graph on n points. Now, if you look at the statements of the theorem, you will not find this out. But if you read the proofs, uh, and I have to say, I don't think reading the proof is enough because uh, it was my this time around my third reading of the proof, I was actually asking myself, what's the difference between the Cayley graphs in theorem two and theorem four? And if you do that, you'll see that they're actually exactly the same. Now Sabaduce, uh, he doesn't mention this and he doesn't discuss its consequences. This is not meant as a criticism. This is just a statement of fact. In the sixties, um, the papers were, if you go back and read them, they're sort of, terse. There wasn't a lot of discussion about what this means, um, things like that. But what this means is that since those two Cayley graphs are the same, we don't have to use the quotient that we used. We can use what some people would call a strong quotient. If you think about it, if we have an empty graph in between any of the two uh, vertices, when we collapse them, uh, if you have a wreath product with empty graphs, you don't lose any of the combinatorial information. Between the two parts, um, you have either every edge or no edge. So all I have to do is to tell you there is an edge and you can recover, you can blow it back up and get complete information. 
And we can quotient by sending edges to edges and non-edges to non-edges if we quotient by uh, the appropriate subgroup. Um, and this is because between any two left cosets, we have either every edge or no edge. And if you choose your H correctly, and this is as K was in the statement of the main theorem, it's as big as we can get, uh, subject to the condition that we had, that it's a union of double cosets. Um, much of the information about the Cayley graph actually projects to the coset digraph and vice versa. You can lift information from the coset graph back to the Cayley graph. And this seems to be not very well known. Um, and the net effect of this is that some problems about Cayley graphs of G and double coset graphs of G are actually the same. So let me give you, I'll end. Um, oh, Rachel and I rediscovered that this stronger quotient could be used. I'm sure Sabaduce, uh knew it, but uh, like I said, he didn't mention it uh, or that uh, any of the consequences. So let me give you some problems and I'll go through these one by one just uh, it's a little more dramatic that way, I guess. So here are some problems where enough information projects and lifts to show the certain problems for Cayley graphs that is equivalent to the problem for double coset graphs. Uh, first off, chromatic number. Um, this was known for a long time. Uh, there's an exercise in uh, uh, Bondi and Murdy's book um, on this. Um, if you wreath a graph with an empty graph, the chromatic number stays the same. Uh, that's all there is to it. Uh, independence number. An independence number projects to an independent set, uh, and it uh, and it lifts to an independent set. Probably a bigger one, but you can determine the independent set, uh, the independence number of a Cayley graph from its coset graph, uh, and vice versa. Now I wanted to throw these in to just let you know that okay, not everything I'm talking about is about uh, symmetry. Um, but let's talk about symmetry. Um, I can recover the automorphism group of the Cayley graph from the automorphism group of the coset digraph. And vice versa, if you tell me the automorphism group of the Cayley graph, I can tell you the automorphism group of the coset uh, graph. You have to tell me the, the H, uh, but then there's, there's no problem. Isomorphism, if you fix a particular G, two coset, uh, two Cayley graphs of G are going to be isomorphic if and only if their corresponding coset graphs are isomorphic and vice versa. And not only that, but you can even um, take the isomorphism, the isomorphism for the Cayley graph will induce an isomorphism between the corresponding coset graphs and uh, an isomorphism between the coset graphs will lift uh, to an isomorphism of the uh, Cayley graph. Um, now, you might think that this means that the isomorphism problem for vertex transitive graphs is equivalent to the isomorphism problem for vertex transitive graphs, but this isn't quite true because a, a Cayley graph can be uh, a Cayley graph of more than one group. However, isomorphisms for all coset graphs is equivalent if you can also solve the problem of determining when a Cayley graph of G is isomorphic to a Cayley graph of other groups and you know those isomorphisms. Um, and this means that the isomorphism problem for coset graphs, if you've solved uh, this when is a Cayley graph, a Cayley graph of more than one group problem, uh, these are equivalent. For me, the reason I really like this is uh, that um, I've done some work on this problem of determining when a Cayley graph is isomorphic to a Cayley graph of more than one group. Um, several people have, but there's a bit of a question as to whether or not this is an important question. And I think that this uh, answers uh, that question. For me, though, the biggest one was the uh, consequences about isomorphisms for a fixed G. I like to work on the Cayley isomorphism problem. It asks, when are two Cayley graphs uh, isomorphic? Well, more specifically, are they isomorphic by an automorphism of the group? Not very many people work on the corresponding coset graph problem. 
And now I no longer care because the two problems are actually the same. There's a moral to the story. I don't know why I thumbed down because now I have to do it again and again. If you solve the problem for Cayley graphs of T or double cosets of T, you should check to see if your property can be lifted or projected to the other class, i.e. Uh, we should just routinely, if we discover something about Cayley graphs or coset graphs, see if we can, if we solve the problem in the other, for the, for the bigger uh, class or the smaller class, whichever one you prefer. There's a little bit of a danger here. Danger. Um, the danger is that in real life, you would never solve the problem for your coset graph, lift it. Uh, I'm sorry, you would never solve the problem for your coset graph by lifting your coset graph to a Cayley graph, solving it in the Cayley graph, and then projecting back down. That's because there are many more vertices in the Cayley graph typically, and there's gonna be a lot more edges. So when I say that these problems are equivalent, what I'm really saying uh, is that, well, they are equivalent, uh, but in a, from a practical purpose point of view, you're always gonna solve the problem for, probably for the double coset graphs first, because they're smaller, and we all know that problems are typically easier if you have a smaller number of vertices and edges. So this is really just of theoretical in interest. Um, and that's why we have the moral of the talk. So if you say came up with an algorithm that solved a problem for Cayley graphs, and you noticed that it projected to coset graphs, you wouldn't want to use the same algorithm. You want to rewrite your algorithm and optimize it uh, for graphs that are wreath products with empty graphs. All right, uh, that is all for me. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ted. Any questions? Well, if there are no uh, questions, thank you all. I have a question. Uh, which one? Yes. Do you uh, have a question? Yeah, yes, yes. Oh, okay, yeah, go ahead. So I just wanted to ask that uh, there is a conjecture or a problem that the majority of vertex transitive graphs are KD, right? If I remember. Correct. Some people believe it, some people don't believe it. So if this, Correspondence you are talking about is it uh, give some insight to this problem or to this conjecture? I've actually thought about that, and I think the answer is unfortunately no. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I see. So because you have a kind of every you have a correspondence right between vertex transitive graphs and Cayley graphs. So every vertex transitive. There's a construction, if I understand. Yes. Uh -huh. the, the problem is that when you go from the smaller graphs to the larger graphs, the number that you have, the number of Cayley graphs of the group G is exponentially more than the number of coset digraphs. The other problem that you have is um, when I look at this correspondence, the number of vertices isn't always the same. So I would have to consider this for every subgroup of G. And so I think the, the number of uh, problems that you would run into, you'd have to have a bound on the number of subgroups of, of uh, G, and then you'd have to know how many lifted and, and things like that. And I just don't think there's mm -hmm. much hope. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, Ted. Any other question? Well, if not, let's uh, thank to Ted once again and uh, see you next week at our last research seminar of this semester. Uh, thank you and bye. <laughs>